I said hello to Sherlock Church of Christ. There we go. That's the, I, I want him to stop talking, honk. That, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> All right. Uh, if you have uh, songs that you got from Stan, the nice young man who was handing those out when you drove up, let's go ahead and sing it if you got it. Spirit of the Living God. Spirit of the living God, fall fresh on me. Spirit of the living God, fall fresh on me. Melt me, more. Valley is the next song. We'll have a prayer after that and a couple more songs. We'll get you on up here and hopefully it gets a little warmer. I don't know if it's warm for you guys, but it's kind of chilly up here. I have found a friend in Jesus. He's everything to me. He's the fairest of ten thousand to my soul. The lily of the valley, in him alone I see. All I need to cleanse and make me fully whole. In sorrow he's my comfort, in comfort he's my stay. Every place, every care on him to roll. He's the lily of the valley, the bright and morning star. He's the fairest of ten thousand to my soul. Oh, who he all my grief has taken, and all my sorrows borne. In temptation he's my strong and mighty tower. I have all for him forsaken, and all my idols torn. From my heart and now he keeps me by his power. Though all the world forsake me, and Satan tempt me sore, through Jesus I shall safely reach the goal. He's the lily of the valley, the bright and morning star. He's the fairest of ten thousand to my soul. He will never, never leave me, nor yet forsake me here, while I live by faith and do his blessed will. A wall of fire about me, I've nothing now to fear. With his manna, he my hungry soul shall fill. Then sweeping up to glory, to see his blessed face, he wearers of delight shall ever roll. He's the lily of the valley, the bright and morning star. He's the fairest of ten thousand to my soul. Thank you. Let's go ahead and bow our heads and we'll have an opening prayer. Dear gracious Heavenly Father, we ask that you give us your presence in this worship service, that we are doing things according to your will, that you would have us do it in a way that edifies and encourages and strengthens this church. Thank you so much for the church, Lord, and help us to truly appreciate that and that gift you give us to have one another to iron, sharpen iron, and to bring those back from the pit who are might be on the edge. We know that there may be many now because many people are suffering, many people are uh, disheartened, many people are, are in need of strength, Lord, and, and you can give us that strength and we can give each other that strength through your love and the love we have for each other. And we just, we thank you for that example. We thank you for Jesus that came here to show us what suffering truly means, to show us what love truly means and uh, as an example for all of us and help us to look for opportunities to be Jesus for someone 
as Brother John W. Smith would say, be Jesus for someone and and know that people are hurting and they make rash decisions and they, they lose their temper and they have anger and wrath and they have all these things in their lives and they, they just want to be free of those things. And we, we need to show them the way, Lord. Thank you so much for um, the nice weather and the smoke. Thank you for keeping the fires down and help to continue to... Uh, Help those who are helping the fire um, control and be with those and give them safety. Be with those that are fighting the coronavirus and help them to give them wisdom that we make the right decisions in this regard, Lord, for our society, uh, for the church especially. And we just thank you so much. Thank you for the eldership here and uh, those that continue to lead us and give them that wisdom as well. Thank you for John and his efforts every week to try to encourage and uplift us and instruct us. And, and thank you for all that he does behind the scenes that we may not even know about. Um, once again, I want to thank you so much for giving us this body and help us to truly appreciate it. And to keep it as tight as we possibly can. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. We saw thee not is the next song. I don't know if I've said how much I love this song, but it just, it just, from a Christian's perspective, is everything that it, that we need to be. I, I think just the outside world needs to hear this. We saw thee not when thou didst come to this poor world of sin and death, nor yet beheld thy cottage home in that despised Nazareth. But we believe thy footsteps trod its streets and plains, thou Son of God. But we believe thy footsteps trod its streets and plains, thou Son of God. We saw thee not when lifted high amid that wild and savage crew, nor heard we that imploring cry, forgive they know not what they do, but we believe that deed was done that shook the earth and veiled the sun, but we believe the deed was done that shook the earth and veiled the sun. We gaze not in the open tomb where once thy may gold body lay, nor saw thee in that upper room, nor met thee on the open way. But we believe that angel said, Why seek the living with the dead? But we believe that angel said, Why seek the living with the dead? We walk not with the chosen few who saw thee from the earth ascend, who raised to heaven their wondering view, then low to earth all prostrate bend. But we believe that human eyes beheld that journey to the sky, but we believe that human eyes beheld that journey to the skies. The song um, before the lesson today, if I can find the page, Beulah Land. This one we don't sing too often. I hope to hear it again in person someday with y'all. Because it's a beautiful song.
I've reached the land of love divine And all its riches freely mine Here shines undimmed one blissful day For all my night has passed away Oh Beulah land, sweet Beulah land As on the highest Mount I stand, I look away across the sea where mansions are prepared for me and view the shining glory shore, my heaven, my home forevermore. The Savior comes and walks with me, and sweet communion here have we. He gently leads me by his hand, for this is heaven's borderland. Oh, Beulah land, sweet Beulah land, as on the highest mount I stand, I look away across the sea where mansions are prepared for me, and view the shining glory shore, my heaven, my home forevermore. The zephyrs seem to float to me, sweet sound of heaven's melody, as angels with a white robe throng join in the sweet redemption song. Oh, Beulah land, sweet Beulah land, as on the highest mount I stand, I look away across the sea where mansions are prepared for me, and view the shining glory shore, my heaven, my home forevermore. Man, Joe, what a great selection of songs. Takes me back to a good day, some of those songs. Haven't heard Beulah Land in about 15 years. That is awesome. So glad to be here today. Grateful for the sun shining. When uh, Beck and I moved from uh, Montana, the day we had, we had uh, movers come and, and actually pack our U-Haul uh, for us. I wanted to do it professionally so it'd show up without, you know, issues. So anyway, we hired three professional guys, and um, when they were loading stuff from the house into the truck, it was six degrees on March 10th. And uh, we were, of course, kind of complaining because you have to have all the doors open when you're moving, and so the house was freezing cold. And you know, and finally these guys said, we need, we're gonna take a little bit of a break, about a 20 minute break. And so they're outside sitting down and uh, I went out there and I go, you guys want to come inside and sit down? He goes, no, that's all right, we're good. And I go, oh, man, it's only like seven degrees right now. And they go, hey, as long as the sun's out, it doesn't matter how cold it gets. Oh. So remember, folks, for the most part, the sun's out. So we know that you guys are all bundled up, and that's great that we're here together even in these conditions. We're going to continue to look at our... Uh, sermon series called The Flock That Rocked the World. We're looking at uh, specifically the church in the book of Acts, chapter 2, that very earliest first congregation. We're looking at that early church, that New Testament church is revealed in the, in the Bible. And uh, so if you want to turn your Bibles over to Acts, chapter 2, it says in verse 42, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and the prayers. And so we've looked at, it was a saved church, and it was a studying church, and now I'm slowing down a bit and really trying to unpack what does it mean that they were developed, uh, devoted to 
the fellowship. The fellowship. First of all, let me tell you, I love salt. No, I mean really, really like salt a lot. If you ask anybody in my family, they will concur without hesitation that John McCraney, the fo that's my wife honking, by the way, right there. I love salt. Recently, Becky told someone, John salts the ocean before he goes swimming. I mean, that's, you gotta love salt, right? If you ever been on the South Bay over there by Newark and there's cargo salt ponds where it's, they make sea salt, and uh, you know, I've been really tempted to just jump out of my car and run down there and scoop a bunch of that stuff up, just right out of the water right there. Why? I love salt. Now my last physical that I had with my primary care physician, she was running through all my numbers from the blood work and she looked through there, you know, and she goes, well, your sodium levels are pretty good. And I went, yay, more salt. Because you know, doctors usually say, oh, you got to get off that salt. You got high blood pressure. You got to need to cut back that so sodium. And even though I've been told that in the past, I still didn't cut back my sodium. But you know, that last bit of blood work is just very encouraging because I get to have more salt. Yes, I get to sit inside a restaurant. I sat inside of a restaurant at Black Bear Diner last Sunday. Inside. It was amazing. I forgot how good it was to sit inside a restaurant. And we're sitting at the table and guess what I asked for? Oh yeah, salt and pepper. The pepper wasn't for me. That was for Becky and others. But man, could you mind bringing me the salt? Because I love salt. I love it. Why? Well, because it makes everything taste better. That's why. I learned to love salt in the Coast Guard. Now, I don't know if any of you have ever eaten a military meal in a chow hall, but you'll understand why I love salt. My two favorite things in chow hall were salt and salsa. You can put salsa on way more than you think you can. Because when they're cooking that food, they're cooking it as bland and as, as big a portions as possible. And so I just learned to really salt my food and I've never stopped. Let me tell you how how bad it's getting, okay? I decided I need some new salt and pepper shine, uh, grinders on my table. You know, I've been noticing that that's the way to go these days. You get your rock salt, you know, your pink Himalayan salt. You know what I'm talking about? And then you, oh, oh, I thought I knew how to salt before. No, 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 no. So on Amazon, I ordered a couple grinders. One does the pepper, the other one does salt. Check this out, ready? It's got a button on top, it's battery operated. Oh, 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 oh. Not only that, it's got a little LED light so I can see where my salt is landing when I do. Let me tell you, I'm a happy man. Mmm, love salt. Salt makes everything taste better. Salt enhances hidden flavors. Where am I going with this? Well, Jesus said, you're the light of the world. He also said, you are the what? The salt of the earth. His church, according to his own words, is to flavor and enhance this tasteless world. Much of that flavor has to do with our words. Words have tremendous power. Christians using words have tremendous power and effect, either for encouraging people or discouraging people. Years ago, I heard uh, Richard Rogers in a class at uh, the Soul, uh, what was it, Tulsa Soul Winning Workshop, and I was in, I barely got a seat into that class. Anyway, he said, everybody in the church is a leader. You're either leading people closer to Christ or you're leading them away. Our words have impact. Our words matter. So if the Bible is true when it says that our words have power, they have the potential for good, then why is it that many of us in the church feel very little impact by our church life? Why is it that those who haven't been in church in nine months really don't miss all that much? Why is that? That's really what the point of this series right now is. If we were the flock that rocked the, ch the world, if we are, then people would desperately want to be a part of us. It would be bothersome not to be in 
this church. And you know what? We've got a parking lot full of cars, and that means that we have a fellowship here that's worth coming to. Amen? But I want us to stop taking for granted that because we come together in a large group and we chit chat and have surface communication with one another, that that's meeting people's greater needs. I'm, I'm trying to encourage us to engage in those deeper conversations that can't be found in a church building or a parking lot. I'm, I'm trying to get us to pick up our phones and call one another and ask how people are when we know they're not doing well. Or better yet, church, why don't you pick up the phone and call someone else when you're not doing well and stop being so private about your pain. You don't think anybody else knows what pain feels like? You don't think anyone else in this congregation has suffered because of injustice or fear of a medical report or might lose your job or have ornery kids? I mean, this church has never had any ornery kids, has it? <laughs> I've heard stories. I know better. We are here for each other. It's good to have those surface conversations at the table. It's good to have those conversations in the foyer. But those large settings prohibit things that are critical to our spiritual welfare, like the confession of sins, like disclosing our doubts. Those large settings prohibit confiding in one another. We're, we're afraid if we open up to someone, someone else will overhear that. Why is it so difficult to break through these walls of superficiality? Well, that's because we live in a superficial culture where people say, hey, how you doing? And they don't really care how you're doing. People from other nations come here and it's their first time in America and an American say, hey, how you doing? And they start answering the question and the Americans already turn it away. We walk into another. They didn't care how you're doing. It's just their greeting. They over there, they say, hello, bonjour, right? Over here we go, hey, how you doing? And the Europeans think that they really want to know how they're doing. And so they start telling them how they're doing and the American does not have time to listen to the answer. Superficiality just is rampant in our society. Everything's on the surface. Everything's in the minute. Everything's in the moment. Everything's in the micro moment. And it affects our fellowship. It affects our mission to others. Why is it so difficult to get beyond the surface? Well, because there's tension. That's why. Did you know that um, you can actually put more water inside of a glass than it is uh, labeled to hold? You can fill a glass all the way up to the rim and keep adding water slowly and it'll, it'll create like a, a bubble, on, well, not a bubble of water, but there'll be more water in it than it can actually hold. How come when you go to the river, you see these little bugs are scurrying across the top of the water? Why is it that one of the sharpest things you ever have is a razor blade? You can take a razor blade and pretty much cut anything, but if you lay a razor blade on its side on, in water, it'll float on the top. Did you know that? It's called surface tension. There was a scientist who was visiting a high school and he was talking about physics and science and chemicals and all that stuff. And one of the people in the class raised her hand and says, how does soap work? And uh, the scientist sort of smiled and he says, well, soap just makes water more watery. What it does, it breaks down the surface tension of water. And so that the water can actually get in there and, and, and rinse and cleanse and, and heal. And it's time for us to get beyond the surface, the natural tension that's in our culture and even in our church culture and allow the water of life to wash each other's wounds, to heal us beyond what we would ever get in just chit chat. Our words have power. 
They have destructive power and they have constructive power. We saw last week some verses about that. I want to take your attention to the book of Proverbs. Okay, if you have your Bibles, go to Proverbs. Okay, we're going to actually start in Proverbs 15. A couple of days ago in my office, I decided to read the entire book of Proverbs and look for every verse that had something to do with speech, tongue, words, talk, anything to do with this, anything to do with communication. Started in chapter one, we read all the way through verse uh, chapter 31, and I started doing hash marks. Every time I found a verse that mentioned tongue, speech, words, and I, then, I, then I highlighted those verses in a special color. Over 90 verses within that book talk about speech. And wisdom, wisdom tames the tongue. That's what Solomon and the writers are trying to get across. Look at chapter 15 and verse 1. A soft answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. Boy, that's worth a bumper sticker huh if you ever worked in customer service hello that's a good one isn't it you ever raise a teenager <laughs> yeah that's a good one look at verse 2 the tongue of the wise commends knowledge but the mouth of fools pours out folly verse 4 a gentle tongue is a tree of life but perverseness in it breaks the spirit verse 7 the lips of the wise spread knowledge not so with the heart of fools and so we see the book of Proverbs is continually seeking to help us control and tame that wild tongue that James talks about. Proverbs 17, if you'll go on. A couple good ones there. I love this one in 17, verse 27. That's pretty good if you go over there, huh? Whoever restrains his words has knowledge, and he who has a cool spirit is a man of understanding. It gets even better in verse 28. Look at that. Isn't that good? Even a fool who keeps silent is considered wise. You want to reveal your intellect? Keep talking. Just keep talking. Who He who closes his lips is deemed intelligent. Oh, that's really good. Chapter 18 and verse 8. The words of a whisperer are like delicious morsels. They go down to the inner parts. What do we call that? Gossip. Chapter 18, verse 13. If one gives an answer before he hears, it is his folly and shame. I am so guilty of this. Oh, I've been terrible at this. I am, well, one of those people that likes to finish people's sentences for them. Anybody experienced that with me yet? Hey, wait a minute. No, no, wait a minute. Now, come on. It's true. This is so true. If somebody starts slowing down or maybe forgets a word in a sentence, I, I want to help them out. Besides, let's go. We're talking, right? In Dallas, Texas, while I was going to preaching school, we attended the Oak Cliff Sunset Church of Christ. And it was mostly seniors. And so I was in the hallway one Wednesday night and a deacon was talking with me. And he was, in that church, you had to be really old even just to be a deacon. In any event, he was, he was talking about his day. And he was like, now, John, my wife and I got in the truck and we headed over to the and i go grocery store the grocery store went over there the piggly wiggly we walked in though did you know those doors open without you having to push it they just open automatically for you as you walk into the store you know and we decided to go over to the and i go uh, cereal no produce produce aisle we're looking at the maters and all this stuff you know, and as he's talking, I'm like, uh, uh, and, and finally he says, Brother John, you're not in California anymore, brother. You need to learn how to slow down. Yeah, I'll never, I know, I know. Look at it, it says it right there. If one gives an answer before he hears, it's his folly and shame. Slow down. 
Think about what you're saying. Chapter 21 and verse 23. 21, 23. Whoever keeps his mouth and his tongue keeps himself out of trouble. You know, it's hard to get in trouble when they keep your mouth shut. I mean, what are you going to be accused of if you don't say anything? Or you say little. Finally, chapter 29 and verse 20. Do you see a man who is hasty in his words? There's more hope for a fool than for him. How many times? How many times as soon as you have said it, your heart gets convicted that should have not been said? I mean, it barely got past your dentures when you realize, oh no, this is not going to go well. How many times? Have you just heard someone say something and you fired that response just like that and you went, you know what I'm talking about. That's exactly what God's word is talking about. Those hasty words. Those hasty words. Well, in the New Testament, we have a lot of instruction too about the tongue. I'm going to look at a couple of my favorite verses. I want you to go to the book of Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4. Let no, uh, verse 29, 429. Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths, but only such as is good for building up as fits the occasion, that it may give grace to those who hear. I've got that highlighted in fluorescent pink. That verse has changed my life. It's improved my ministry. That verse has improved my life because it gets me to filter what I'm saying with the Spirit's help. It's interesting, the original word used here in the Greek for corrupting is the same word used to describe fruit that's gone rotten or fish that is putrid. And what is the apostle telling us? He is telling us, stop with the toxicity, the evil speech, the corrupting talk and start being gracious in your speech. Don't just blurt out something you think someone needs to hear without first filtering that through grace and being sure that what you're saying is going to build that person up. I had been in this congregation for four years and I had finally decided that I wanted to use my GI Bill to go to preaching school. Again, remember, not to be a preacher, no way. But I had the GI Bill and I got a letter from the government saying if you don't use the GI Bill by 1990, you're gonna lose that benefit. Well, dude, I put in a lot of time to earn that and I wasn't gonna lose it. So if I was gonna go to college for anything, I wanted to learn the Bible. And so I applied and was finally accepted to the Preston Road School of Preaching. And, and so we made that announcement and you know, the church was rejoicing for the most part, I think, you know. Anyway, shortly before we moved, the associate minister of that church pulled me into his office. He says, John, I think you need to know that several of us here don't think you're going to make it and graduate. Really? I just want you to know, we don't think, there's a lot of us that doubt, because you've had several jobs, John. I mean, you've had like four jobs in four years. And I go, brother, I sure wish you hadn't told me that. And the reason why I say that is because I walked out of there so mad at that church. I was so angry. 
I mean, what I thought he would say, being a minister, was, hey, it's going to be tough, but you can do it. No, what I heard was, you don't have what it takes. Now, I don't know if he was doing reverse psychology, but before I left California to move to Texas, I'm like going, I'm going to finish that school no matter what, just to put my, right? Would it be a surprise to you that later on we found out that that associate minister was actually a secret alcoholic who was embezzling funds from the church? Would that be a big surprise to you? Yeah. Wow. Right? So look at chapter 5 and verse 4. Let there be no filthiness, nor foolish talk, nor crude joking which are out of place, but instead let there be what? Thanksgiving. So watch those jokes, brother. Here's another one, Colossians, and we'll be wrapping up here. Colossians chapter 4 and verse 6 says, Let your speech always be gracious, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how you ought to answer each person. Right before that, he says, I need you to pray for me. And when you pray for me, pray for me that I that I talk well. He says in verse 4, that I may make it clear, which is how I ought to speak when I'm preaching about Christ. It's all about the mouth, the power of the mouth, the power of the words. And in Colossians 4, 6, season your speech with grace. That means gentleness. That means maturity. That means be a verbal blessing person. Have you ever heard of George Bernard Shaw? George Bernard Shaw was a philosopher, a writer, very popular in England. He was also very tall and thin. At the same time, there was another Brit who was extremely popular and well published by G.K. Chesterton. He was a very, what we would call, corpulent man, okay? Back then, people used to write notes to each other. That's how they communicated. George Bernard Shaw wrote a note to G.K. Chesterton saying, if I was as fat as you, I would hang myself. Chesterton's reply, if I ever felt like hanging myself, I'd use you as the rope. I mean, words, even more so. Opinions. Oh, man, opinions. In Proverbs 18, 2, a fool takes no pleasure in understanding, but only in expressing his opinion. Bill Bullard once said, opinion is really the lowest form of human knowledge. It requires no accountability, no understanding. It's the highest form. The highest form of knowledge is not opinion, but empathy. For it requires us to suspend our egos and live in another person's world. Someone once said that opinions are like armpits. Everybody's got a couple and they usually stink. Here's how to start an argument online. You want to start an argument online? Number one, here's what you do. State your opinion. Number two, just wait. Okay? Disciple, decide right now that you will use your words to glorify God and to build others up and to bless others to God's glory. If not, follow the Proverbs and be silent. No matter what someone has said to you in the past, forgive them for that. It's time for construction and not destruction. Tell people what they need to hear. Do it with grace, a big dose of love, and it can change your life. Everyone in this parking lot has been changed by those kinds of words. It's time. It's time for us to season our church with grace. And we're going to have a song by Joe right now, and then after that will be the communion with some closing remarks by Brother Stan. Thanks for being here at church. Love you.
wonderful lesson, John. Thank you. Uh, I've been on that other end of the stick, to, or uh, I've been there myself with finishing people's sentences, and I really got to watch that. Kind of interesting, though, we have a preacher that finishes sentences. It's usually the preacher asking the congregation to finish their sentence, like, for God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten, you know, you know what I mean. So I just thought that was funny. So I guess he's having us violate Proverbs when he does that, but John's not that bad about it. I'm just, just joking, y'all. Uh, something I wanted to mention before our song here, uh, uh, we had a youth event Friday night that went really well. Uh, you can say edifying the body has been a challenge during these restrictions. I'm sure the elders would uh, agree. Uh, doing it for our youth has been almost non-existent. So if anybody has a young person, they want to get involved with something, please reach out to Donna and we'll make sure you're included next time and there should be more of those down the road. So uh, we just really need to take care of our young people and start looking to do those things again. So thank you guys for being patient with that. Also, it's been brought to my attention that the uh, next Sunday will be the first Sunday of the month. We're going to be doing the special donation for the missionary work. Just make sure you come um, prepared for that if you're willing to donate. That uh, last month was a little bit low, uh, and every dollar that we send is almost literally food on the table for someone. So uh, just keep that in your heart for next week. Lamb of God. Your only son, no sin to hide, but you have sent him from your side to walk upon this guilty sod and to become the Lamb of God. Your gift of love they crucified. They laughed and scorned him as he died. The humble king they named a fraud and sacrificed the Lamb of God. O Lamb of God, sweet Lamb of God, I love the Holy Lamb of God. O wash me in His precious blood, my Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God. I was so lost, I should have died, but you have brought me to your side to be led by your staff and rod and to be called a Lamb of God. O Lamb of God, sweet Lamb of God, I love the Holy Lamb of God. Oh, wash me in His precious blood, my Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God. Heavenly Father, as we take this time to bring back to our memories, our minds, our hearts, our soul, on that day that upon the cross, your son was there hanging, bleeding, with his broken body. Somehow that is very hard for us to comprehend sometimes. So we pray that you would help us to understand the true sacrifice that was given for us and the opportunity that was given to us through that sacrifice, but also the three days later when he arose, that he had conquered death and sin and took upon him all, not only the past, the present, but also the future. And Father, it's the hope we have through him that we come to you now as we remember him. But as that we do so in a proper way and a manner that we not 
be like Mary Magdalene when she came to the grave and found him missing. Help us not to find that missing in our lives that we can always have and the knowledge of knowing that your son is there. He has a rose and he is with us. As we partake of this on the bread, which represents his body as he had asked us to do. For this we pray in your son's name, Jesus. Amen. Shall we continue to pray? Almighty Heavenly Father, as we continue taking in this communion, at this time we take the fruit of the vine, which represents the blood that was shed there, and the life that it gives to us, and the knowledge of knowing that you have arose and conquered death, and then through you we have the hope of everlasting life with you. Father, help us to really not only think of these things at this time, but as we read your word daily, help us so we can study them and understand the true meaning behind them and give us the courage we need to go out and be soldiers for you. For all this we do and ask through your son's name, Jesus. Amen.